Assalamu alaikum. My name is Fadwa Wazwaz. Now doing a presentation today on what is security. So I'd like to walk through this presentation. As I mentioned, I still have other another video that I said about God testing you versus you testing God, and some other videos. Still, I'm kind of behind, so I apologize for that. But they're coming. Is all I'd like to say. Let me just. Share the screen, share, 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 okay, then share. This up here. Well, what is security and how do we find it? That is the theme for, for this month. And it's from my book, Love is Deeper Than Words. Again, the teachers that uh, I benefited from are, if you check in the back, there is a page about acknowledgments. And those teachers that have contributed with their knowledge that benefited me in writing um, this book are noted in the acknowledgment section. Others are claiming that they have benefited me are actually making claims that they cannot support at all. What is security? There is a belief that most people seek love in all the wrong places. In fact, this book was titled Love is Deeper Than Words. I, however, disagree. Most people are seeking security. We open our Heart and listen, you know, to what's going on around the world. Most people are really seeking security, not just now, but historically, because we're looking always at things from our own, you know, just our own life experiences. And here, like living in the West, we're not seeing, for example, people who are living in Yemen or people who are living in the Congo, people who are living in Sudan or other parts of the world where what we take for granted you know, something that they are seeking and searching for and looking for. It has nothing to do with the fact that we figured it out. The U.S. itself is a very young nation, and it was founded by people who came and took this country from another people. So if Europe was so great, they would not have come here and taken another land from its people. They would have stayed in Europe. But they came and migrated here. They migrated to Australia. They migrated to New Zealand. So they found it perfectly okay for them to migrate and take other people's land. But they're always hypervigilant of other people coming to the US or to Australia or to Europe taking their land. This is why there's always that fear of immigrants taking over America, the U Muslims taking over America. Usually based on, they say, because when you commit a crime, the impact of the crime is on your heart. And you see people based on that impact of that crime. So if you came and stole another people's land, you dispossessed them, you took over their country, you're going to be always in this hyper-vigilant state, fearing other people coming to do the same thing to you. If you just came, like, for example, uh, peacefully, and you saw, you know, uh, residents, you're not gonna have that fear of people coming to take over your land. In fact, when Palestinians were caught off guard and they were very open to, for example, Jews coming to Palestine when all the doors were closed in their face because they were thinking they just wanted safety and security. And so they were caught off guard when they started to see you know, this Zionism project unfold and they were plotting and planning to take over Palestine. 
they were not prepared for something like this. Why? Because Palestinians did not take over the land from someone else, kick them out. So they don't have that hyper-vigilant looking out, you know, trying to see who's trying to take over our country mentality. The Pharaoh had it. He was always afraid for his security. Is that security, though, or is that fear of retribution? Because when you harm others, you might say it's security. But in reality, it's a fear of retribution. And so what you really are seeking, you know, if one removes the cover of the Israeli uh, propaganda, what they're really seeking is to be pardoned for all the crimes that they've committed. They're, oblig they're obligating people to be pardoned for all the crimes they committed, are committing, and will commit. Restorative justice, the emphasis is on safety. So whenever you're trying to like get two parties together, the very first thing you try to do is to make sure both parties are safe. But you also try to work it out so that there is not an imbalance of power when they're talking with each other because you can't have restorative justice if one side is unprotected and they're speaking to the oppressor who has bombs, you know, and the high advanced uh, weaponry, and the other is unprotected, fearing they're going to use that weaponry against them. You can't have a conversation like that. So in restorative justice, you have the very first thing to promote safety and security is you have to equalize, you might say, the power balance in the conversation. You cannot um, create an empowered balance in the conversation. And this is why when you speak to people in power, it has to be open and transparent. More often than not, they're not going to listen to what you have to say. But you recognize that there are people who have a different consciousness than they do, different mindset that they do, that will be able to recognize and like that message will resonate with them. But it has to be open and transparent so that they cannot deny and then project and then brainwash and normalize. And the Palestinians have went through that cycle of 1948. After like what we're seeing right now, is literally close to what happened in 1948. But because we, there were no cameras to, to document to the extent of what they've done, they were able to deny, project what they did onto Palestinians, and then brainwash people, making us feel guilty, 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 and then normalize. Our faith emphasizes one of the names of Prophet Muhammad upon him, peace and blessings, is Al-Amin, translated as the trustworthy one. If we actually take the Arab dictionary or any dictionary that can like translate some of the root letters, usually begin with the root letters and expand on that root letters, all the different possible um, meanings that you can derive out of Alif, um, Meme noon, it's right here. Where did I put it? Alif, sorry, it's a typo. Alif, meme, not mean, but meme, noon. If it comes up to, to trust, like in a nutshell, you just combined it to be secure, to be in safety, to confide it. So that again, the security is not just a physical security. If you look at all of these definitions, spiritual security, emotional, mental security. So the, you, you could see all the different layers of security come are derived from the word al amin Iman 
or faith also share the same root letters. So when I was looking through the Quran, just for the root letters, Alif, Mim, Nun, I found like there's over 73 pages that reference, you know, words or that use words with Alif, Mim, Nun, or 800, about 79, 880 using alif mim there are probably even more than that but again you could see again what I'm, I'm trying to get at is the emphasis on security the prophet upon him, peace and blessings said excuse me i'm not sure why this is happening okay the prophet upon him, peace and blessings said the muslim is the one from whose tongue and hand people are safe and the believer is the one from whom people's lives and wealth are safe. See, so notice the description for a Muslim, someone who surrendered to God. Mu'min is somebody who not just surrender, like, you know, at the acceptance in terms of like saying, I accept this, but one who has went through the phase of struggle that they believe. Now their, their words match their actions. So this is someone whose people's lives, not notice the definition, not their life. It doesn't say a Muslim is someone who no one speaks bad about them and nobody harms them. Notice the definition. It says one whose tongue and hand people are safe from. So to have faith, Notice that the, the, the definition, other people are safe from you. And then the mu'min is one, people's lives and wealth are protected from you. That's the believer. It's not the one who's obsessed with his security. It's the one who grants because you can only give what you receive. So if you receive from God, as the mu'min, receive from God, then you can give to others what you receive from God. If you receive faith from God, you receive security from God, then you can also give that to others. But if you yourself received from the Nazis, and that's what you will give to others. Security here, the emphasis on the security is not your own security. Definition of a Muslim is not the one who's perpetually and always safe from others, but it's the one who people are safe from. Same thing for a Muslim, like we're not running around stealing other people's land or taking what doesn't belong to us. People are safe from you. And that's why his name was Al-Amin. He's the one that people were safe from. Can we say this about Israel? Can we say that people are safe from their tongue and their hands regarding Israelis? Can we say that yes? No. Can we say that people surrounding Israel feel safe with their lives and their wealth from Israel taking it? No. You can't give what you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. As I mentioned before, you can't receive from God if you're turning to the Nazis. You're going to receive from the Nazis. So now, why tongue? Why are we saying tongue? If security is only physical, why worry about the tongue? You know, sticks and stones will break my bones, but, you know, words can never, you know, because genocides begin with speech. The very first stage of genocides. And this is something that 
those who studied the Holocaust wrote this information. So we actually take it from them. They came to this realization, this aha moment, and we say, we agree with you. Genocides begin with speech that humiliates and demonizes us because all oppression stems from a diseased heart and mind. You give what you receive. So if you turn to God, you believe God is great, and he does not wish for his creation. He created all of us, Jews, non-Jews, black, white, you know, Native American. He created everyone. He did not send down laws to pit us against each other. Clearly, you're not turning to God if that's what you're coming with in terms of the, you know, you've had over 75 years. If we look at the last 100 years, you've had power in your hands. You should have been able to promote peace. You had 100 years with power in your hand. But that's an indication that you were not turning to God. You give what you receive. If you turn to God, you receive wisdom, knowledge, insight, how to make peace in the Middle East. But you are turning to the Nazis. You have this love-hate relationship. You hated them because they don't accept you. You hated them because they don't like you. You hated them because they made fun of you. But deep down, you wanted them to love you. You wanted them to accept you. You wanted them to make you know, peace with you. So here you are, you're able, the Holocaust is done. You're able to make peace with Europe, with Germany. But you come to a land that was not involved in the genocide that we do not deny you experienced. And you come with the teachings and the lessons of those you hold in awe, which are the Nazis. So let me share again. It may take a while. Hold on a second. Well, the first step the Nazis were going to do was humiliate the Jews by cutting off their beards or making fun of them. And the Israelis do the same thing to the Arabs. These young soldiers with these guns humiliate Palestinians at the border. That's apartheid. Recently, you couldn't use a word like that. You couldn't use genocide. The last three or four months, we've learned that, um, no, it applies. People now use the word genocide, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, all these terms that are part of our vocabulary. I was given a tour by friends of mine in Jerusalem of, of the West Bank. These friends of mine that were still there in Jerusalem, uh, they're part of these uh, human rights groups where they sit and they observe the border so that these soldiers don't humiliate. Humiliation is a big part. And the Israeli military learned that from the Nazis as well. The first step the Nazis were going to do was humiliate the Jews by cutting off their... So, again, you receive from who you hold and off. Which gets me to another section that I'd like to take you to. I mentioned this also earlier before. So... We all face traumatic experiences in life. You can turn to God and get the wisdom, the knowledge, again, the uh, understanding of how to process these situations and how to heal from the situation. The reality is most of the time we have this love-hate relationship with our oppressors. So in my last book, God intervenes between a person and their heart. The one before this one. I ended the chapter with, I ended the book, the last chapter with, praise belongs to God alone. In that book, I mentioned that chapter, praising God inoculates you from becoming a narcissist or being drawn to narcissists. The best protection against narcissism is praising God. 
not taken in by strength, by charm, or voice honks. So if you're somebody who is oppressed and abused, don't turn to yourself. Don't turn to the narcissists. Turn to God. This inoculates you from being drawn to people with this false showcase of strength, charm, or voice honks. What are the signs and symptoms of narcissism? Now, there, everybody has their own, if you will, understanding. I'm just sharing mine. Via the trial of Islamophobia, because the very first things of abusive power is what not to do. And so often we're trying to run away from a trial, but in running or escaping away or like, you know, you know not, not that we shouldn't like escape the pain and, and the genocide that, that it's taking place, but that we don't take time to say, what can I learn from this oppressor for myself? God taught us many lessons by being profiled in the eyes of others. Concern, concern yourself with rights and responsibilities, not profiling. Like, you know, whether this person is Jewish or not is irrelevant. I'm not really concerned if you're Jewish or not. That's not how I'm going to process a given situation. I'm going to look at your actions, your rights, your responsibilities. This is what Islamophobia teaches us. This is what we should be learning from oppression. Jewish or not Jewish is irrelevant to me. Because it's not about you being Jewish, that there's a disagreement or a tension or an issue taking place in the Middle East or elsewhere. It's about rights, responsibilities, actions. That's our focus. That's what, if you turn to God, that's what he would help you to focus on. He's Jewish, he's not Jewish, put that aside. That's irrelevant information. I don't really care. And then he says, look at rights, responsibilities, actions. That's our focus point. What's coming out of your tongue? Like I mentioned previously. What are your hands doing? Are you violating people's property, people's you know wealth, people's lives? That's, if you turn to God, that's your focus point. You're atheist, you're Jew, you, 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 you know, you have all these cruel uh, secular views, cool secular views. It's irrelevant. It's a different discussion. We bring coffee, refreshments, you share your views, I share mine. We can, you know, duke it out in a uh, fun, understanding way in, in, a, in a forum. That's not part of the discussion. That's irrelevant data. What is important is what's coming out of your tongue. What are your hands doing? Are people's lives safe from you? Are people's wealth, land, you know, whatever they own, safe from you? That's what God would turn you to. That's what you would be focused on. Are we focused on that? I don't really think so. What are the roots of narcissism? Being great in the eyes of others or in one's own eyes. And this is the best picture for it. Here, this person sees themselves as great. And here, these people are looking for a voice hog. Someone with charm, showcase of strength, you know, there is it, you know, charm, strength, voice hog, you know. Here's this and here's that. These are the ones that are attracted to a narcissist and this is the narcissist. This is my view, my perception. You might think it's the other way around, which is fine. Narcissist cannot accept wrong or loss. So when he lost the election, 
even if it was like, you know, you can, they cannot accept loss. They cannot say, for example, okay, you know, the American people, he's, he's threatening even now, if he doesn't win, there's going to be a bloodbath. That's one thing you should know about narcissists. It's, they're attached to winning. They're not attached to principles. They're not attached to people being safe with their lives, their property. You know, uh, again, you know, safe from your tongue, safe from your hands. They're not. They're not attached to that. They're attached to being like this, having a you know cheering crop. That's narcissism. They respond with wrong, with sinful cunning or Kate. Now, in his case, he doesn't like do it. He's kind of like blunt. But usually, people who are like narcissists still respond like with schemes. They always have to overpower their opponent. They can't engage their opponent and put the truth out there. They always have to overpower their opponent. There's rumors or lies. This part did come from him. If you recall, even though I don't really agree with Obama, he started off with the birther story. Create chaos or sedition, you know, the January 6th sedition situation. You can't just, again, lose graceful. It has to be an all-out war. You don't see, for example, one of the things about the political situation of Ali Hassan and Hussein is how they dealt with situations of civil unrest. You don't see him responding like Ali. You know, went through negotiation, arbitration. Like Hassan, who declined, said, here is, you know, the reins in your hand just for the civil well-being of the community. Or like Hussein, where he responds with an argument facing, uh, like, let's just say that he feels that people are oppress oppressing him. No, it's overpower. He has to overpower and you, you'll always look for the rumors, you look for lies, you look for sedition, you look for, again, it's always overpowering. It's not face-to-face, -face. it's always overpowering. How do you tell the difference between healthy self-esteem and arrogance? Talking about here, security. Healthy self-esteem is the courage to be, bring your evidence for investigation. This is another thing that you look for. Whether they're Jewish, they're not. They're atheists, they're not. That's for another conversation. What you look for is, are they open to bringing their evidence for investigation? Can we investigate the evidence? It's a key telling point. Can I investigate your evidence? If you, I cannot investigate your evidence, then again, it goes back to they're just saturating the community with rumors and lies. If I can't investigate your evidence, then you believe in your truth. You're telling me you believe in your truth. Because the thing about, you know, people who are lying, there's disinformation and misinformation. This information is when you know you're lying but the people that you're lying to don't know you're lying. You know, that's why you use that kind of voice hog mentality, the charm, the, the showcase of strength. And you cover that up to let people think and kind of, you know, brainwash you into thinking that you're telling the truth when you're really lying. Misinformation is when you assume someone's telling the truth, like you think they're telling the truth, but you never really investigate it or verify or clarify. You're just running around spreading you know, a falsehood as truth, assuming or thinking that you're actually doing the right thing. That's why I say that most roads that lead to hell is by good intention. So you're thinking because you have a good intention, it's okay because you're thinking, I got good intention. But you're not really doing, again, the work to protect others from your tongue, from your hands, people's property, people's lives. You're thinking about your protection from others, but not others' protection from you. See the difference between the mindset and the consciousness of either, of both? 
we see this in the Quran where Moses says, and like I mentioned before, with restorative justice, it's about the imbalance of power. You always want to take your argument front and center. Because this way, you can kind of like call them from the shadows to the light. Most of their, you know, manipulations and schemes are always in the, in, in the shadows. So you want to bring them to the light. At every chance, you got to bring them into the light. So you see your appointment is on the day of festival when the people assemble at mid-morning. This is when like at that moment of light, it's easy to see things. You're not blinded by the sun and you're not like an overwhelmed by its blaze. Your appointment's on the day of festival when the people assemble at mid-morning. So Moses telling us, I believe in the truth that I share with you. So you can always tell those who are lying is that they will look up for every which way that they can to avoid coming openly and transparently before people with their truth for investigation. They will close the doors. They will kill journalists. They will fight tooth and nail to make sure that you are not hurt. When people fail to respond like Moses upon in peace and resort to sinful cunning games, like I mentioned, behind the charm is denial, anger, fear. So they are afraid. Nobody's saying that they're not, but they're not afraid because they're being attacked. They're not afraid because their lives are at stake. They're afraid because they attack. It's that fear of retribution, not fear of, I'm just, you know, farming the land and here comes these individuals that want to just kill me on the land. Shame, it's a fear connected to shame. Shame is, again, a lack of remorse, you might say. That's literally the best way to think of that type of shame. Where you committed a crime, like 1948, Nakbe, but you have no remorse over what you did. There's And remorse is not external, by the way. Remorse is always in the heart. So God turns to you and he puts that light in your heart. It's a light. Remorse. Now, when you don't accept that remorse, you reject it, what takes over in your heart is shame. It's the darkness of rejecting repentance, remorse. So usually when that's rejected, you get anxious. You have a lot of anxiety inside. That's why you're always like wondering, are they going to, you're always afraid for your security, you're always afraid for your security. But then you also have a guilt, which you don't accept it's from external because people are now coming up and they're saying, you did this, you did that. And so you do it by reversing what they say and running around trying to make them feel guilty, making this person feel guilty. Uh, you still are, you know, you're engaging in organ trafficking, uh, making them feel guilty making that person feel guilty. You know, people are pointing at actions that the Israeli government is doing and they're hiding behind. They're saying this because I'm Jewish. No, you could be like, you know, I I, I, I researched, you know, people like, if you want to be honest in the storytelling, you got to research what people are saying. And the founder of Hamas was saying, I don't care if you're my biological brother. If the if he treats me this way, I'm I'm summarizing here, then I'm gonna fight him in the same way. So here he's what is he fighting? Is he fighting you because you're a Jew? Or is he fighting you because of your actions? One can say a narcissist will avoid clarity at all costs. That's why there's always chaos. Like, and but however, employ projection with skill. It's been 76 years. We just celebrated a 76 year remembrance of the next. You have to ask that the average American or anyone in Europe who has, you know, been involved 
for 76 years in what's going on in Palestine. Their governments are involved. And then say, what do Palestinians want? Just simple questions. They would not be able to answer. Why? You got this supposedly uh, phenomenal media. Well, the point of media is to educate. Bring out the truth about things. How can you give yourself awards when you've been covering a situation overseas and we were we to test? You know how they, like you say, one of the things about a school is you go, you test the students, like you're, you're teaching math, for example. You test the students and the students get like 96%. You say, that's a good teacher. It's good students, but also a good teacher. So everybody now wants to go and learn from that. Teacher, you want to learn math, chemistry. You test the students and then year after year they get great. Everybody wants to go and learn. They're like, you know, this is a great teacher and all the students want to go learn from this teacher. But if you were to test Americans or test Europeans about the issue in Palestine, I don't think they would pass 10%. And who's doing the teaching? The mainstream media. Who's teaching Americans about what's taking place in Palestine? Who's covering the facts on the ground in Palestine? The mainstream media. Now, if we go to a school and year after year, we test students and they get 10% in math, 10% in chemistry, 10% in whatever field you might want to say. They just keep getting 10%, 10%. What would we say about this teacher? We'd say they're not qualified. They're not, they don't have good skills. Eventually, the, 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 the school will probably say, you know, we need to let you go. Or, or, or parents would take their, their students or their children and they would go somewhere else. We have a lack of clarity, a lack of understanding, something that we have spent billions upon billions of dollars. We've been covering. It's not like you, you go and you write Palestine and you see like they're not covering it. They're covering it all the time. Yet if you give a simple few questions to the American people, I can guarantee you they would not get 10%. Right. What does that say about those who are educating the American people on this particular situation overseas? It's about, again, talking here about the tongue, or you could say, you know, you're typing, but they're avoiding clarity at all costs. They're just covering it, but covering in a way that it's complicated. Go watch the Taylor Swift uh, conf uh, excuse me, show. It's complicated. Go look at Cardi B. It's complicated. Go watch this comedy. If they charge thee with falsehood, my work to me and yours to you, you are free from responsibility for what I do and I for what you do. While they avoid clarity and they avoid investigations, they, however, want to prosecute everyone in town. And they want to prosecute people, and this is the interesting part, for their own crime. They will engage in terrorism. This is how Israel was founded. And the United States itself was founded by terrorists. And they wanted to prosecute everyone for terrorism. While celebrating the terrorists that founded their nations. The U.S., Israel, mostly the European nations. And I've focused a lot on France with Algeria because I'm aware of uh, situation that took place in Algeria. There are other countries too. They went in and they engaged in colonization and they killed lots of people. And then after they did it, they pardoned themselves. 
And now they want to prosecute people, get this, for their own crimes. So narcissists cannot swallow investigations. They cannot swallow that, you know, what they do, they will be held accountable for. And what we do, we will be held accountable for. They, they can't swallow that. They don't want to be prosecuted, but the way they avoid being prosecuted is by prosecuting others. And so they're constantly, so they can keep you drained you know, with nonstop falsehood, nonstop, you know, guilt, 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 uh, and then playing judge, jury, and executioner, you know, playing God. This is kind of some of the manifestations to look for. Again, whether they're Jewish or they're not Jewish is irrelevant. They may use Jewish scripture to do that. They may use Christian scripture to do that. They may use Islamic scripture to do that. But here we're not really, we're going to say, we're going to take the scripture and just say, respectfully, let's put that aside. God taught us to look at what's coming out of your tongues, what's coming out of your hands. Are people's lives safe from you? Are people's wealth safe from you? That's what we're going to put front and center and question, judge, investigate. Respectfully, put your scripture on the side. We can invite you over coffee and tea. You can tell us about how you interpret uh, the story of Moses. We can talk about how I interpret the story of Moses. And we exchange coffee and tea. And then that's the forum for that conversation. Right here, we're looking at what's coming out of your tongue. What's coming out of your hands? Are people's lives safe from you? Are people's wealth, their land, their property, is it safe from you? That's what we're going to keep bringing back the conversation to. Sheikh Ishar always said, love who you want, hate who you want. Do not oppress anyone. As I mentioned, you know, a lot of times people have a false interpretation of certain stories in the Quran, and one of that is Joseph's story. And Joseph's story teaches us, this is why sometimes we're like obsessive with the issue of love. Uh, people who loved him abused him, impressed him. And people who hated uh, Joseph, someone like, you know, who hated him, or I wouldn't say like, maybe like his brother's envious, oppressed him. But that's not what we're going to be focusing on. I love this person. I don't love this person. I hate this person. I don't hate this person. That's irrelevant. Now, if you say throw him in the well, that's important. If you say you are subhuman, that's important. We're going to put that on the table. You know, if you go ahead and you bring a bunch of women to sort of fabricate, you did something wrong. You're bringing now a bunch of women and you're telling these women to act in a certain way so that you can justify and rationalize your behavior. doesn't matter again about the gender. Sometimes it's, it's the men that do it or, the, you know, the others. The point is that you committed a crime against your faith, your values, or whatever. Like I said, once someone does something wrong, what they do is then they project it on an innocent person, but they don't stop there. Then they want to prosecute that innocent person. They want to play judge, jury, execution. So you bring a bunch of women, you tell these women to, again, act in ways that tries to justify and rationalize the transgression against Joseph. It's the actions we are looking at. It's the actions that we are looking at here. People do not look at the actions. They're always getting lost into Jew, Christian, Muslim, man, woman, black, white. These are all variables God uses to test us. Put those on the side. Look at the actions. What's coming out of your tongue? It's coming out of your hands. Are people's lives safe from you? 
Are people's property safe from you? We look at it with the issue of Joseph, those who loved him, and those who hated him. He was not safe from their tongues, from their hands, his life, you know, thrown again into the, the prison and with his property too, because, you know, he had, you know, lived with his, with his father. Now he's ending up now being in prison. So what happens to his property? So you could see that love who you want, hate who you want, do not oppress anyone. Now with the issue with Joseph's story, one of the, also the important thing here, again, seeing father, same ethnicity, Same gender, him and his brothers. So don't get caught into the variables. Look at the actions. That's your focus point. We're always going like here. And that's why we're getting to loss with anti-Semitism. And, you know, look at the actions. There is a belief, as I said, that most people are seeking love in all the wrong places. I disagree. Most people are seeking security. Joseph's story is about seeking security. Seeking security from, from a domestic level. His brothers were oppressive. Uh, from a situation you might say, since he was hired, it's kind of like a workplace, you might say, because he was now hired under the prime minister. And this is where he faced the issue with uh, Zuleikha. So now again, he's facing, you might say, a now, a workplace, he's not, he was not secure there. But also the arc, you know, the arc of his whole tribe was not safe in the land that they were living in. The fear of, you know, oppression, political oppression. He was not. So you could see like multiple type of oppression that he was in need of security. That's why he ends the story with not Yawadud, who doesn't turn to God's name, the Wadud, but Al-Wali, the protecting friend, because he's seeking protection. Back when I was starring my book here and the initial project, it was about power and protection, but then I went into power and oppression. But again, it's about people who are seeking um, historically security a domestic level at, you know, workplace employment, you might say, workplace, their livelihoods. That also, you know, at a political, you know, level, you know, their country, national level. They were also in the international arena seeking security. So that was really the driving force behind people throughout their lives seeking security. And Joseph's story gives us a lot of insight into that. Where he turns to God, the name, and well, the protecting friend. The relationship again between uh, believers, men and women, is protecting awliya, you know, and it is derived from al wali, uh, protecting, you might say, friends of each other. Not in a you know manipulative way, but you're protecting each other's again from your. Mentally, emotionally, social, spiritual, like I mentioned earlier on. It's protection. You, you make sure others are protected from you. And so I mentioned that Al-Amin is translated as a trustworthy one. <clears throat> and also the, the sanctuary. If you look into the definition of Al-Amin. A safe person, person who's safe. People are protected from him. No one ever had to worry about the prophet attacking them. Uh, their fighting in terms of war is different. There are grounds for war. But he's doing that to protect others from harm. People crying, saying, you know, we need security and these individuals are violating us. You can't just sit and do nothing. Is protecting them from harm. The messenger of Allah upon him, peace and blessing, said, the Muslim is the one from whose tongue and hand the people are safe. Again, 
and the believer is the one from whom people's lives and wealth are safe. And the emphasis on safety, not love. He doesn't say the Muslim is the one who loves everybody and everybody loves him. Nor does he say the mu'min is the one, you know, the believer is the one who, you know, loves, you know, the whole, you know, everything. Because there are some people, like, I, I have to be honest, I don't love what the, those Israelis are attacking and abusing others. And I'll show one right here. I don't love her. Why would I want to love somebody who's calling for the annihilation of others? Why would I want their love to begin with? Why would I want their love, their acceptance? They're calling for the annihilation of people. Why would I want their love or love them? That's not healthy. It's not healthy for you to love somebody who's calling for you to be genocide. In Joseph's story, I guess, again, we talked about Al-Wali, thou art my protector or protecting friend. But indirectly, if you look at through Joseph's story, it's also, as I mentioned in other blogs, a shaheed, the witness. This is the one who, because one of the abuse, again, with the guilt, 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 and the brainwashing, you really need like someone trustworthy that's going to tell you you're, you're not imagining things. You don't want this crowd just, just to let you know why you need a shaheed. Because you've witnessed this and you recognize this is wrong. And this is wrong. You don't want to be this. But you also don't want to be this. And so again, one of the, the first things you take from abuse of power is what not to do. So you don't want to turn to somebody who's like this in your own community or somebody who's like this. You turn to the witness. That's why I said indirectly, if you look at Joseph's story, you want somebody protecting friend who's going to bear witness and help to clarify, help you to process what is taking place. Give you the moral clarity that you need and the certitude that you need. That's what happened to Moses. Like when he left the Pharaoh, he didn't, he didn't have that moral clarity, given the, you know, arcing, you might say, reality of oppression. When he went to the um, land of the Midian, then he had the arcing uh, background of faith. So he got that moral clarity. Now he's able to face the Pharaoh. So by turning to God, the witness... Here, Joseph, he, he was not in the house of another prophet. And I mentioned in the story when I talked about it, sometimes you can't find anyone there. It's not always you could find, like, like Moses, Pound and Peace found another prophet. You know, he was led to another prophet. Sometimes you don't have that. You may be someone who's in prison or you may be around people who are, they lack more clarity, let's just say. Or they're morally bankrupt. You can turn to God, the witness. In fact, you should always turn to God, the witness. And that's what Prophet Moses did. And he was led to uh, the Prophet Shai, as some scholars say. Verily, my Lord understands best the mysteries of all that he plans to do. For verily, he's full of knowledge and wisdom. So you can look into that. Throughout the Quran, God reprimands people who seek for protection other than God. Parable of those who take for protectors other than Allah is that of a spider who builds to itself a house, but truly the flimsiest of houses is the spider's house if they but It's kind of like a spider building a house. It's kind of like Israel building a state. They're not making sure other people are protected from their hands, their tongues, as I showed like in that earlier video where they keep uh, demonizing and dehumanizing others, uh, their wealth or their lives. No, they're not 
building a house to do that. They're building a house where they can continue to engage in all these violations, yet demanding that they are protected from retribution for the war crimes they committed. That's the flimsiest houses, is the spider's house. Easier said than put in practice. We have to acknowledge that. It's easier to, for me to give this presentation than to put it in practice. I agree. Usually the failure might carry a message or training too for the individual that you took the means for protection, then a means God uses to protect you. An example is that the Israelis took the means, meaning the state, as a god, it's their golden calf. That's supposed to protect them rather than turning to God for protection. And we see that's again with the issue of the story of Joseph. He was protected in the well, he could have drowned. He was protected in the house of the Aziz. You know, he could she could have like, you know, violated him. He was protected also in prison, and he was protected when he was given a uh, state of was promoted to a state of station of oh, what's the word I'm looking for here <clears throat> in the kingdom he was given like a special VIP status and he comes out of that seeking what to protect himself notice how much oppression he has went through He's seeking to protect others because a famine is coming. So he, he requests a special seat, which is to be in charge of the treasury. Why? So that he can make sure he's safe? No. So he can make sure the people that are going to be facing this famine are safe. So he sought a position to protect others from a looming famine that's coming. Again, the believer, the person who's close to God, gives protection, turns to God. What he receives from God, he gives to others, gives protection. A case in point, and of the two, to whom the one he considered about to be saved, he said, mention me to thy Lord. But Satan made him forget to mention him to his Lord, and Joseph in, lingered in prison a few more years. So sometimes, again, he tried. This is part of the training he had to go through, where it's okay to be trained you know, because this is a realization. This is, again, certitude. It, it gets into your heart. It grows and grows, as I said, hope in two, in two directions, a previous theme. So here his heart is being enlightened. In his mind, you know, you always have to try when, until you come to that place of certitude, 100%. He had to, you can't just come to that place by, by just sitting down and just saying words. So he has to try with all the means available around him that are perfectly okay for him to use to get himself out of a situation that is negative. So he turns to this individual who's going to be saved, and he's going to be freed from prison, telling him to go make a case for him. And so it's perfectly okay for us, what we're doing right now, like, you know, as Palestinian, this is all part of the training that we have to go through. Like Hajar went, you know, seven times between Safa and Maru. This is all part of the training. So all these things that we are doing, going to the ICJ, writing, speaking, this is all part of the training ourselves. But we, if we're doing it while turning to, again, to the witness, to the wali, the protecting friend, and we're processing that interaction in our lives, and then we just grow in faith. So he grew in faith, even though the man forgot, Satan made him forget to mention him to the king. 
And so he lingered in prison a few more years. He didn't become upset that he forgot to mention him to the king. He just turned to God. And in that, again, he just grows in faith. So we're, we're trying all these things right now with Ghazi. And we're seeing like there's no result. But we should keep turning to God as we're trying all these things. It's not a particular, we shouldn't take any means that we use as the key. God could use any means that he wants to open the door of ending this oppression and freeing and liberating the people of Ghazi. We keep trying, but while we're trying, we keep turning to God, processing what we are doing. We do it openly, we do it transparently to try to promote a moral clarity and an understanding. And we keep the focus on, again, what comes out of your tongue, your hands, our people's lives safe, people's property safe from you. And that should be front and center. You're Jewish, you're not Jewish, you're woman, man, black, white. That's for a different conversation. Keep that off the table. I end with uh, the verse in the Quran. When we witness or experience oppression, I can tell you that it was a state of shock upon shock. Uh, times I feel excruciating pain in my legs, like literally just, I don't know how others are, you know, deal with it, but for me, I feel tremendous excruciating pain. It just shoots all the way down. I feel at times like I can't even walk from how painful looking at some of these pictures are. So I really can only pray and try my best to reach out to those who are experiencing what they're going through right now. Because just looking at some of these photos is excruciatingly painful. So I, I don't know, but I, you know, I keep praying for everyone in, in Gaza how they are dealing with this, not via the screen, but seeing it live day in and day out without rest, without reprieve without the resources that they need to survive. I do not in any way judge anyone's anger if they process this expressing anger, uh, if they process this expressing uh, like uh, what may appear as despair, you know, all the different ways that their body may be like struggling to deal with it, I do not judge, hold anyone in judgment. This is all part of the process of dealing with something that it is very hard to witness. Um, I am inspired by those who have shown, demonstrated phenomenal faith that, you know, and I pray for them for role modeling that for all of us. Um, it is beneficial for all of us to witness that as well. And I pray God rewards all those who've experienced and all the helpers and the supporters, those who stood and witnessed um, and raised their voices based on what they've witnessed, those who've wait, paid with their lives and their limbs and their children had to like be sacrificed and they suffered as well. This is from chapter 14, 32, and I mentioned it more than once, that do not think that God is not aware of what the wrongdoers do, that at an appointed time, at an appointed time, he will respond. Now, one thing I would like to point out is we have to recognize that you have to continually to be warning people and promoting moral clarity. As you know, here was done as well as Moses did here. I mentioned here with Moses, lessons on, on Moses. 
Because God does not punish until people receive sufficient work. So if we, the best way to speed the appointed time, you might say, is to make sure that there you promote moral clarity to the best that you can. To give the sufficient reasonable warnings such that people can bear witness that they receive that moral clarity and they cannot say no one warned us. We don't know. And that's why I write and, and, and I speak. It's not to dehumanize others. It's not to attack others. It's not to feel superior or something. It's simply you have to warn people who are engaged in violations and transgressions and other, against others. There's one who has power over you. There's an appointed time. If you continually engage in these transgressions and violations, when the appointed time comes, you will be called to account. And that account will be a moment of regret and you will not have the honor to feel remorse and to repent. Just like Pharaoh, the very last moments he wanted to like uh, repent, God said, no, not now. So now, you know, it's because repentance and remorse is a gift. It's a light. Treasure it now while you have the opportunity to receive it. Because when the appointed time come, you will be denied that opportunity to do so. What you rejected, you will not be able to receive again because it will not be given to you to receive again. So now the doors are open, the doors of repentance until the appointed time comes, the doors of repentance are open. And repentance when there's violations requires reparation and repairing the heart. I end this presentation with that a warning. That there's one power over you and you're worried about Hamas, and I'm bringing front and center God. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.